Hi guys, welcome back. For today, we're going to have the Capital Asset Pricing Model, CAPM. The Capital Asset Pricing Model is about the relationship between risk and returns. To appreciate what we are going to discuss, let us first visualize what risk means. Refer to the following diagram. In this diagram, we have here the stock price in the y-axis and the time period in the x-axis. The apple green line represents the expected stock price after a period of time. Note that as time passes, the higher the stock price is expected to be. Hence, it is expected that there would be returns. We also have the plain green line, which pertains to the worst case scenario. This is what could happen if we are unlucky. With the aqua line, this is the best case scenario. This is what happens when we are lucky. If we're going to look at the possible things that can happen, our expectations may not actually happen. It can go below expectation or above expectation. This is what risk is. Risk is the likelihood of an outcome to deviate from expectation. It may be an upward or a downward deviation. If we're going to look at the diagram again, see that things can go better or worse than expected. The likelihood of this deviation is what we call risk. Now, let us talk about the relationship between risk and returns. We all know the phrase, the higher the risk, the higher the return. For an investor to take more risk, he should be compensated with more returns. Assuming that for a perfectly safe investment, you are willing to take that investment for a rate of return of 5%, assuming it is a sure thing. Now, if we will introduce the chance that you are going to lose, you will no longer be motivated to take that investment if it offers the same rate of return. You need to be compensated with more returns, say 7%, or 10% for you to be motivated to take that investment. Now, this is where the capital asset pricing model comes in. It describes the relationship between systematic risk and expected return for assets, particularly stocks. An important assumption that we have to make is that the investor is diversified, that is, invested in a basket or portfolio of securities. Now, to appreciate this assumption of the capital asset pricing model, we need to understand how risk in a standalone basis, assuming you have only one investment, differs from risk in a portfolio basis, assuming that you have a basket of securities. Let us refer to the following graph. To show us the relationship between the number of securities and the risk level in a portfolio. Generally speaking, if we are going to increase the number of securities in a portfolio, say from 1 to 2, the overall risk will go down. So why does this happen? Because of diversification. To illustrate, let us say the stock price of company A and the stock price of company B where the two are competitors. There are events that would benefit one and harm the other. So again, assuming they are competitors, if A's market share went up, that event is beneficial to A, but that would be detrimental to B. It can also happen the other way. There are events that would harm A, but would benefit B. As a result, these deviations can cancel one another. If they do, the overall risk in the portfolio would go down. So, 
apply the same logic if we're going to invest in three stocks, four stocks, and so on. Note that as the number of stocks increase in the portfolio, the level of risk goes down. We can now divide the risk into two, the diversifiable risk and the market risk. The diversifiable risk is also known as the non-systematic risk. This is the risk that can be eliminated by diversification. Meanwhile, market risk, also known as systematic risk, is the risk that is inherent in the market. It cannot be eliminated by diversification. So, going back to the assumption of the capital asset pricing model, the investors are presumed to be diversified. They hold the portfolio. So what matters now is only the market risk. Given that we are going to talk about market risk alone, how do we measure market risk? We have a coefficient called the beta. This is a measure of a stock's volatility in relation to the overall market. To understand beta, let us imagine the overall market represented by a stock index or market index. In the US, it is usually the Standards and Poor Index. In the Philippines, we have the Philippine Stock Exchange Index and many more depending on the geopolitical unit. Now, by definition, since this is the market index, its beta is equal to 1. If we're going to look at the stock price, the y-axis, through time in the x-axis, we would be able to find some movement in this index. Now, how are we going to measure the beta of a particular stock or portfolio? Well, we will just compare the volatility of that stock or portfolio to that overall market's movement. Going to the next diagram, we have here a, a blue-green line with movements that are more modest relative to the overall market. As such, its beta is said to be less than 1. Another example. For this light blue line, we can see that the movement of this stock or portfolio is more erratic than that of the overall market. As such, we can say that the beta is greater than 1. So in summary, the overall market's movement is the benchmark for our comparison. That is, the beta is equal to 1 for the overall market. If there are securities and portfolios whose prices will go up or down more modestly than the overall market, its beta is less than 1, the blue-green line. And if there are securities and portfolios with movements that are more erratic than the overall market, the beta is greater than 1, the light blue line. Just to test whether you comprehend that concept, let us go to the following sample case. The following table summarizes the monthly changes of stock X vis-a-vis -vis the market index. So stock X moved plus 1.2% in May, while the market plus 0.9%. In June, stock X went negative 3%, while the overall market went negative 2.1%. July, stock X went up 1.8%, while the overall market went up by 0.4%. Is the beta of X equal to, greater than, or less than 1? Okay, 
The answer is, the beta is greater than 1 for stock X. Note that stock X is more volatile than the overall market. The increase in the stock price of 1.2% is more volatile than 0.9% of the market. Negative 3% is more volatile than the market's negative 2.1%. And plus 1.8% of stock X is more volatile than the overall market's plus 0.4%. Again, the beta is greater than 1 because excess price changes are more volatile than the overall market's movements. Now, as we have mentioned a while ago, the higher the risk of a security, the more that security should compensate the holder with more returns. The higher the risk, the higher the returns. This can be expressed in the cap M formula. Cap M, R sub S is equal to R sub RF plus RP sub M times beta sub S, where R sub S is the required rate of return on the stock, R sub RF is the risk-free rate of return, RP sub M is the market risk premium, and the beta sub S is the beta of the stock. So that we can visually comprehend the capital asset pricing model, let us put this in a diagram form. We call this the security market line. A line drawn on a chart that serves as a graphical representation of the cap M. Now again, in the y-axis, we have the rate of return. In the x-axis, we have beta this time. And again, beta is the measure of the market risk. If we're going to note, if beta is zero, the rate of return of the security is at its lowest point. This is what we call the risk-free rate of return. But if beta goes up, the security should provide the investors with more return for them to be motivated to invest in such. Thus, the upward sloping line. Now, let us implement the cap M formula. Let us refer to the following case. The expected rate of returns and betas for three potential stock investments being considered by C Corporation are given below. So we have the investments, the expected returns, and the betas of each investment. The market's rate of return is 9%. The risk-free rate of return is 3%. So is it wise to invest in stock A? Stock B, Stock C, that is what we're going to find out. Now, we will begin with the calculation of the market risk premium. RP sub M. This is the difference between the market returns and the risk-free rate. At what rate is the market earning? Currently, it's at 9%. Market return... 9%. The risk-free rate of return is only 3%. So the market is earning a premium of 6%. This is the market risk premium. Now, let us talk about the expected rates of return. Investment A B and C. We are given 11% for A, 8% for B, and 10% for C. These are the expected rates of return. We are going to use the symbol R hat sub S with the hat representing expectation, the expected rate of return. Now, in addition to the expected rates of return, what's also given is the beta of each investment. This again pertains to the 
risk level for market risk or systematic risk of that investment. So we have a beta of 1.448. What does it mean? Well, we should find out its required rate of return. According to cap M, we have R sub S is equal to the risk-free rate of return plus the risk premium on the market times the beta of the stock. So needless to say, the higher the risk, which is represented by the beta, the higher the required rate of return. Let's find out. So required rate of return of A with a beta of 1.4. Risk-free rate is 3%. Risk premium is 6% with a beta of 1.4. That will give you 11.4%. This is the required rate of return on the investment A. So as investors, we are going to demand a rate of return of 11.4%, but this investment is expected to give us only 11%. So the wise thing to do is to not buy this investment. B. Let's go to B. Initially, we would say that this is a low return security and should be rejected. But take note that this beta is lower. It's actually 0.8. So let's calculate what should we require for B. We have required rate of return, the risk-free rate of return of 3%, the 6% market risk premium, and the beta of 0.8. So that would give you a required rate of return of 7.8%. So although this is earning low, but stock based rate of return is expected to be higher than what we would require. So we would say this is a good investment. Stock C. The beta for stock C is 1.5. So we have here 3% plus 6% times 1.5. The required rate of return is 12%. We just expect 10% from C that's below our required return of 12%. So this is not a good investment. So this is the relationship between risk and required rates of return according to the capital asset pricing model. For more financial management topics, please comment below. Like, share, and subscribe.